Welcome to this special edition release of On The Rocks podcast. Today, we are hosting an audio replay of our monthly mining roundup, this month with the theme of space mining. We were joined by special guest Daniel Sachs, the CEO and founder of the Canadian Space Mining Corporation, to talk about all things extraterrestrial mining. If you'd like to join the Prospector team live in more future monthly mining roundups, be sure to follow us on LinkedIn and join the events. You can also be notified through our weekly Nugget newsletter, so I'll be sure to sign up for that. Hope you enjoy. Yes, yeah. yeah, so to Turn Jay, I think I set it up, but um, Dan is probably a dead giveaway here. Um, but today we are talking yeah. about space mining, which I am super excited about. Um, but before we dig into that, let's go ahead and go around and introduce. Um, and then Dan, I'm going to have you go last. You can dig a little bit more into Sure. who you are and what your background is. So we'll go Tatiana, Emily, Alessandra, and Roundtable like that. Okay. Uh, well, thank, uh, thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Tatiana, and I'm a head of data science here at Prospector. And my background is basically all technology work, uh, development, data science, and machine learning, and all data engineering. Awesome. And hi, everybody. I'm Emily King. I'm the one of the founders and CEO of Prospector and a geologist, a terrestrial geologist uh, by background. Yeah. Alessandra? Hi, my name is Alessandra. I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to be learning with all of you about asteroid mining or space mining because that's something that I don't manage that much. And uh, well, my background is in, in finance, by project evaluation, and I have a degree in a mineral energy economics from Colorado School of Mine. That's how I heard about uh, space mining that much. Very, very cool. Um, I'm Daniel Sachs. I'm the founder and CEO of the Canadian Space Mining Corporation. Um, my background is in uh, not not in space or mining. I guess uh, it is now, but um, <laughs> it was previously in in uh, real estate, uh, private equity investment, development, finance, um, and a little bit of uh, venture capital investing. Awesome. Great. Um, so quick question. So how did you go from real estate venture capitalist to where you're at now? <laughs> yeah, I, I think, uh, thankful to the help of the pandemic, I, I had some, uh, existential crisis, which made me realize that my whole uh, career working in real estate <laughs> finance and investment had been uh, worthless to humanity. Um, to and where you're at Right. And, uh, and so I wanted to, to uh, work on something that could move the needle for civilization. And that led me to, to space and to space mining. Um, there was this return to the moon that was going on uh, called the Artemis missions. And alongside that, it would require uh, a substantial amount of resources um, on the moon, produced on the moon. Um, and so uh, that's kind of wh where it began. Al along with that, I realized there was a a document in in the canadian government called the mining and metals plan which is canada's uh, mining strategy document and um, they had identified space mining being of strategic national importance and no one was really doing anything about it so that was a, a couple of years ago and um uh started uh quite earnestly and then and then uh built from there and and um at one point i guess i had uh uh, unintentionally started a space company. <laughs> Crazy how that happens. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's super interesting because we've been seeing, as you mentioned, a lot of news, especially in the last like couple of months about space mining and asteroid mining. And it seems like it's going from like science fiction to reality. And we talk a lot here at Prospector about deep sea mining, partially because I'm just so fascinated by it. Um, but we're moving our mining futures discussion today to the uh, outer reaches of space, the final frontier. Um, so really quickly, in like two sentences, I would like you all to go around and same pattern here and summarize your initial thoughts on space or asteroid mining. Those of you watching, feel free to drop your thoughts in the comment section as well. Just like initial thoughts, pings, ideas, two sentences, keep it real short challenging here and uh, start again <laughs> okay well uh two sentences are a little bit difficult but um 
to me, it is super important because uh, we cannot always rely just on the resources from Earth, especially as we do expo explore more and more uh, of the space around us. Uh, it's just too expensive to drag everything to the orbit if we need something right there. So definitely the future. And uh, a benefit is it's just exciting. So it's all exciting to explore other planets. So even if it was useless, I would still do it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great motto for, for a new space company, Tatiana. <laughs> even if it's useless, I would still do it. <laughs> It's a passion. <laughs> uh, for me, I think the two sentences would be, um, you know, uh, well, the two things I think about immediately are construction and propulsion. So like, how do we mine things in space to build in space and to be able to further explore space? Like, how do we mine the fuels that we'll need essentially to for propulsion to get even farther out? Uh, and then my other thought is like, gravity? <laughs> like, how do you do separation? How do you process the rocks that you mine without a lot of the techniques that we use here on Earth, not just the actual extraction, but the processing and refining process, I think is going to look totally, totally different in space than what we see here on Earth. Again, also not two sentences. Sorry, Jess. Alessandra? All right, I'll go. I think that my first thought was uh, as a financial person, if it is it's expensive, is it worth it? Is it? It is unpredictable, and most of it. How am I going to value space mining with so uh, so many uncertainties to to value? How are we going to manage demand? What are the revenues of the stream? Do we are we going to use it just in space? Are we going to bring them back back to Earth? So I'm just thinking about uh, cost and if with a current technology or a technology that is in development. If we are going to be make it worth it to to it to extract mineral from the from the space, all all very good questions. I have you know two two thoughts that come to mind, and and one is um, uh, making space more sustainable. So making our activities in space more sustainable, and and that means a lot of things. It means an ability to to refuel rockets in space to reduce the up mass that we bring to space and, and stay places. And then, and then from that, the ability to solve real problems on earth with the technologies that we're creating to, to fill these gaps um, and to disrupt the way we're currently doing the resource industry on earth, which is um, archaic. Awesome. All great thoughts and questions. Um, thank you all for that. I do just want to share, we had last week in our weekly nugget, a poll on space mining. Ooh. Ooh. Um, and so again, I kind of in my head relate space mining to deep sea mining because they are just like these both way out there, like sci-fi seeming things that are now becoming a reality. And when we talk about deep sea mining, everybody's like, no, we can't do it. We don't know enough about the ocean and all that stuff. But then when we talk about space mining on the other hand, most of our poll responders we're like, heck yeah, let's mine space. Um, which I think is a really interesting because in my head, like, do we know enough about space? Like, what about the aliens? <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, so I thought this was a really interesting poll response. Uh, we do have a lot of people that are all for it or like maybe in the near future, like not quite there yet. Um, so I just wanted to share those poll responses here real fast. It's great to see such enthusiasm. Yeah, I was very surprised, um, but it's very, very cool. Well, I think um, one, of the, one of the primary, you know, differences between uh, space mining and deep sea mining, right, is like the the ocean is one of our most important ecosystems, um, and there are, you know, potential for long term uh, catastrophic yeah. effects from uh, making the wrong decisions there. Um, whereas space mining, uh, you know, you're really shifting that activity outside of our ecosystem um, in a way that can can really benefit people. It's the like the NIMBYism. <laughs> That's what I was just gonna say. Not even our backyard. Like it's not even on our planet, so we really don't care. Right. Yeah. Unless we don't yeah. find it. Unless we find like a civilization of extreme NIMBY aliens, and then we. Gotta... <laughs> yeah, or just like, like like little itty bitty microscopic creatures that have the ability to kill us all. Like if they're not happy we're there, like that could That's impact awesome. it. Totally different social license to operate. <laughs> right. Yeah. 
Are you talking about our DNA that came from space and created the right. whole life on Earth? Exactly, Tatiana. We're, we're getting back to our roots. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Um, so before we get, I do have questions like that teed up here. Um, but first, I wanted to go kind of round table again. We'll go opposite this time. We'll start with you, Dan. But when I looked on Google or answer the public for questions that people have about space writing, aside from like the processing stuff, um, the first question is why space? What's the reasons? What's even out there? How realistic is it? Um, is it possible? Is it profitable? And is it even legal? Because uh, who owns space, right? So those are some of the big questions that I see from like just the general public on space mining, besides even the technical processing questions. So we're going to go opposite. Dan, I'm going to start with you to maybe answer some of those bigger questions and then round table to kind of yeah. bring up more questions. <laughs> those, are, those are a lot of questions. So uh, wh why space? I mean, um, uh, I think it's part of our uh, character as humans to explore since we crawled out of the caves and crossed the oceans. It is, uh, we've been trying to answer the great questions of uh, who we are, where we came from, what else is out there, and what it all means. And I think going to space and exploring space is, is fundamental to that. I don't know that we ever answer those questions, but we continue to unravel the mystery only, only to find uh, uh, more mystery. Um, you know, it, it is quite viable. Why, why you would go to, to space and, and space mine is to create a sustainable supply chain in space in order to uh, sustain activity in space for refueling, for life support. Um, and then there are a lot of materials in space. Our, our, our Earth's resources are, are finite. Um, there are an infinite amount of resources. You take the 16 Psyche mission, which has been you know, getting a lot of uh, 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 news around it. Um, and the amount of precious metals on that one asteroid dwarfs the precious metals content of our entire planet. So, um, or the available precious metals content of our entire planet. So I, I think if you, you look at some of these facets, it, it's gonna be part of our long-term supply chain of how we uh, uh, build things within this civilization. If you're looking 50 or 100 years down the road, we have to be thinking about these things now in order to be there uh, at that time. There's also stuff like uh, helium-3, which is going to be crucial if we're able to transition um, to fusion reactors. We're going to need helium-3 that uh, is likely not going to come uh, from this planet. It's going to come likely from the surface of the moon. Uh, in order to uh, sustain that that type of technology, quantum computers and stuff that that also uh, require sources of helium. So, you know, we need to be thinking about these things now as we're building this technology for the future. You know, the other thing is uh, Earth's gravity is not going to change. Um, and I, I think it was Emily, you were talking about, you know, the need to, to build enabling technologies in space, the need to build and construct hardware, whether that's satellite spaceships, and other technology uh, in space from the raw materials there. And we burn almost all of the fuel just getting the up mass into space, into low Earth orbit. It's inefficient. And so at some point, you know, Alessandra, there's there's a tipping point, right, between the economic value of producing stuff on Earth and, and bringing it up to space and, and the economic value of producing material in space once you've um, uh, built enough of a, of a scale uh, in order to do that. Awesome. Thanks for those insight, Dan. Uh, Alessandro, we're going to go opposite here. So you're next on any other questions or any thoughts or insights you might have on that, if any. Uh, yes, I think that what is going to be crucial is already important for mining technology, but I think that if we are talking about space, it's going to be more, it will be the breaking point of deciding to invest in a project or not, because we will need initial capital expenditure are going to be more, more much more expensive than the ones that we have uh, right now in, in the mining projects on Earth. In terms of operational costs, I'm thinking about energy or other uh, special costs that are related to those new to those new technology that definitely are going to change uh, how we value how we value things. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, is the revenue uh, stream? Are we going to be to be using it only on space? In this in in this in those cases, definitely that will be 
that would be very efficient to do it. It may be less expensive, but if we are thinking about once we uh, run out of material that are going to happen in a long time, because we still need to go deep on, on the earth, if we're going to be bringing from space, that would definitely raise costs. And something that Jess asked as well, that I think is important is regulation. Who owns the space? Who is going, how are we going to manage uh, which companies or countries are able to to mine in 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 one asteroid of the other one? Are we going to are we going who is going to own the the because we only have own the earth, we do not own the space. So how are we going to to manage that? And also I think that supply and demand, that's something also important in we are going to to evaluate mining on, on space because that's much more unpredictable. We depend on technology. Um, and also how much time are we going to, re to recover the investment? If we are talking about something that is very in the earth and it's not much, uh, not as concrete as any, any other project that we may evaluate on earth. So that's, those are my, my thoughts about space mining in, fi in the finance world. Yeah, I think uh, my immediate thought from that is both from a legal and regulatory perspective and also an economic perspective is how similar really the economy of space mining might be to basically the economy of cryptocurrencies, right? Where you do have a connection to the way that the current world mostly operates from a financial perspective and like valuation and costs and everything, but there are also these other values that drive that expansion. Um, because to me, like when we start mining stuff in space to build habitable communities and to be able to move around space, like you're doing, you're mining these things because you need them to survive, not necessarily because of their economic value, right? And therefore, who's paying those companies to do that? It's going to be largely, I would imagine, government-driven or quasi-government bodies that are set up to do this. So it's not purely like a like a normal capitalist economic incentive to go do this. It's for all these other reasons. And eventually there will be a space economy that is not reliant in any way on anything on earth, right? Like this is where I'm like a complete sci-fi geek, like have been for the longest time. And my brain goes to the series, The Expanse, right? Where you've got like Mars, the asteroid belters, and then the folks still on Earth, like you'll end up these multiple economies that basically trade amongst themselves um, and have economic ties. But it's not like the way we think about the, the cost of material and the value of material here, right? So it's like stuff that we don't think of as very valuable currently may be incredibly valuable in that construct. Um, but how do you finance it? Heck, I know. Yeah. <laughs> can't do it based off of a return to your point alessandra right it's not really about a financial return at that point yeah i, I, I so, so so you know government is a, a plays a big role in this right um and government is driving the return to the moon that's going on um and fundamentally uh as an international community uh, uh they're working towards that goal part of that re will require space resources um to maintain that uh, and to make that uh, sustainable. So, it, so it's a goal driven by them. Our cost of bringing mass like water uh, and other materials to orbit right now to, to lunar to the lunar surface is around a million dollars a kilogram. Um, and so it, it's backing out of that. If we have to bring every uh, kilogram of water to the moon, that's quite expensive. Um, uh, and of course, th those will reduce as our cost of lunar landers and stuff like that go down. But in order to sustain that, we really need to um, uh, produce the materials there, um, which can then also be brought uh, to look to low Earth orbit. So there's been some great studies done in that um, in that regards. Yeah, to, to me, it's also uh, I think uh, of space exploration in, in a similar way like Emily does. Um, it is actually what we consider the future of human race, right? If you do want to carry on being alive, we need <laughs> to do something about space because our planet wouldn't be habitable for for forever. Um, Mars might be our next place where we can survive as a as human species. 
So we have to do that in any case. And uh, the point of, you know, economic value right now, I think it is more of uh, trying to find some low hanging fruit where we can uh, convince people easily that we need them right now. But in reality, it is similar to financing a war. You know, people always find money to fight, to fight a war because they have a reason to convince their nation that it's necessary. So the money is are always there. There is no actually money. It's it's the work of, that people are prepared to do to survive, and people are prepared to do any work that they need to do to survive. So um, from that point of view, uh, once we get in closer to the potential of extinction of human race on Earth, it will be easier and easier to convince people that we do need to invest more and more in space. In fact, everyone will start investing mostly in, in space. Uh, and uh, from the other point of view, the other interesting part is how do we partition the space? Does it belong to us? Uh, well, technically nothing belongs to us. So whatever we grab, it's, uh, it's ours until somebody contests it. And um, to some degree, it might sound a little bit um, unethical, but in reality, that's, that's what life does. Life grabs whatever it needs for living, and we just try to compete. And then if we have extra resources, we try to let other life also live. So there is, again, <laughs> no, uh, no option for us. Uh, the interesting point, of course, is what is going to happen with the nations on Earth. And um, it would be great to have like one international society where all countries suddenly will become peaceful with each other and try to support each other. But knowing human nature, this is also not very uh, probable. So we'll carry on as we do now. <laughs> yeah, no, I, if I can jump in too on that, I think, Tatiana, to your point, like, and this is where, Jess, as you were mentioning, there are similarities with deep sea mining, where we do have the UN regulating deep sea mining, like, um, approvals, right? And I know, Dan, you might know there, there, is, there are space bodies that at least at a certain level are governing, like, where potential, like, on the moon, at least, where people may be allowed to build up communities, right? Do you know anything? Because, of course, legal and regulatory infrastructure is so key in the regular mining space and the terrestrial mining space, like who, who is in charge of that stuff? Um, so, so it's the UN as well, right? Um, you have uh, the Outer Space Treaty of 1967, which is the main governing uh, document for space, um, the main treaty governing space. Um, uh, and, and then you have, you know, uh, liability then flows down from there to a nation state level. So as a U.S. company or a Canadian company, you're regulated by your own uh, uh, government and they're liable for your activities in space. The problem was when the Outer Space Treaty in 1967 was created, you know, we had a handful of spacefaring nations. We did not have commercial activities uh, in space. Uh, we did not have commercial companies operating in space nor did we have really a concept of uh, the utilization of space resources. So the international community has been uh, trying to move towards a framework for space resources. Um, they have not uh, done so yet. Um, it, it is part of um, uh, the work that needs to be done. Um, and so the, uh, there's the Artemis Accords, which were signed by the US, Canada, um, eight countries total. It's now snowballed to about 25 countries, give or take, um, over the last couple of years. Um, and it is a growing consensus for how to uh, treat uh, commercial use of extraterrestrial resources. But we're not there yet, right? Like it's not at a UN treaty level and, and obviously quite noticeably absent from that are uh, China and Russia. Um, and so we need to get to uh, an international uh, consensus and something that is at a UN level. Is it going to be, you know, off what the Artemis Accords are based on? Maybe, you know, plus or minus again. I, I don't know how far you're going to get from that if you already have, you know, a lot of countries in consensus. And then 
And then on top of that, you've got five laws passed uh, at a nation level at uh, the US, UAE, Luxembourg, Japan, uh, and most recently India passing space mining laws at a, at a domestic level. Very cool. Thanks for that, Dan. That, that answers a lot of questions. <laughs> um, while we're quickly on the, que the subject of questions, I have one from Glenn here. Um, has there been any studies on what mining the moon would have on our, on what mining the moon, I guess what effect <laughs> mining the moon would have on our tides or our ecosystem here on earth? What is the timeline to mining production in space and how do I get involved? Or anybody? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, what's the timeline to mining in space? Let me address that first. Um, timeline to mining in space is, I guess, you know, I'll, I'll ask you, uh, how, how long do you think it would take to get a mine built on Earth? What are, you think, reasonable timelines from concept to operation? So the latest study I saw was, what, like 11.4 years or something on average? Yeah, so, so according to the international community, we need uh, uh, materials produced on the moon, uh, particularly 50 tons of water by uh, 2030. So that's about seven years from now. Um, so those are the timelines. You have international missions being planned, other infrastructure being built that is interdependent uh, on uh, mining on the moon within the next seven years. And look, there are delays happen all the time. You could lose a year or two from that timeline quite easily based on some piece of technology or another not being ready, but that's what we're shooting for. So I, I think within the next 10 years, we'll have mining on the lunar surface first for oxygen and water, and then, and then following that for other, other materials, uh, like, like critical minerals and rare earths. Um, and then asteroid mining, I think we're, we're much further out. We're still trying to figure out exactly how asteroids are composed, um, what their surfaces are made of. We've made uh, three trips to, uh, to asteroids uh, as a species that have recovered materials. So, so two by the Japanese and one most recently with OSIRIS-REx. Um, that gives us uh, more insight than we had into uh, the surfaces of asteroids. But um, there's still some big gaps there. You're going, you know, on the moon, you're in a microgravity environment, right? So you have one six Earth's gravity um, in a uh, asteroid situation. You have uh, on some of these almost no gravity. And, and then, um, you know, it's just a completely different type of environment to be operating in, um, which is going to require a, a larger gap in technology. So I think you're reasonably probably looking at the first you know, small scale asteroid mining in the, in the late, uh, mid to late 2030s. Um, Very cool. That seems so soon, <laughs> which is crazy to me because it's like, it seems like this crazy sci-fi concept. And Emily, I know you touched on this a little bit before, but I know you are a huge like sci-fi geek. Um, what roles do you maybe see popular culture playing in space mining, especially on the side of like public perspective. I know we've talked a little bit about this before um, or on like the technology side of things, Emily. Yeah, I mean, I think in general, the kind of refocus on space is a huge opportunity for popular culture to refocus on the cool parts of science and technology in general, right? And how they all come together in what most people think of as like a theoretical environment. You know, so space mining in particular could get people really excited about geology. Like, what is the geology of the moon, of asteroids, of Mars? Like, what does that mean? Like, what are these minerals that we need in order to, you know, why, you know, for folks that aren't already kind of sci-fi geeks, like, how do you mine water and air <laughs> out of the moon? Like, how does that work, right? I mean, that is a really cool, exciting science project, essentially, to re-engage um, the world's population in how science allows really cool, amazing things to happen. And I hope that that also translates into excitement for innovation here on Earth. And what we, what I think of is like the Velcro effect, right? Like Velcro was invented by NASA, like for spacesuits and other stuff, right? And like now, can you imagine a world without Velcro? Like, no, most people can't, at least ki people with kids like me. Like, what would I do without Velcro sneakers? Like, life would be way more difficult. So, I hope that that's one part and that it gets people really excited, almost like with the moon race. Um, what's the show that's coming back on? We were just talking about it on our team. The one about like 
what would have happened if Russia had won the space race. Um, yeah, for all mankind, like the next season's coming out. Like, you know, like I think for me, I'm always amazed at the fact that we put people on the moon <laughs> without like what we think of today as computers <laughs> or any of the cool gizmos that we have. Like, I mean, that's amazing, right? Some people doubt it. Hello, all you conspiracy theorists out there attending our live stream. But like, I mean, that's amazing that we could put people on the moon without all the technology that we have. So like, what can we do now with all of this amazing technology that, that we've developed since besides just have Twitter slash X, right? Um, so I think that's what I think about is it, it should hopefully change Earth's relationship with science and technology. Um, to have this big push into into space. Awesome. Dan, what about your perspectives on kind of that pop culture yeah, I, vibe? I, I think that's fundamentally the, you know, you really hit on it, Emily. That's the whole ethos of our company, right? Like if you ask what we do at the Canadian Space Mining Corporation, it's, it's solving long-term problems in space that solve immediate problems on Earth. Um, and so that's stuff like... Uh, working on solving these problems around making oxygen and water on the moon, which can address some of our looming challenges on earth related to water and clean air. It's uh, about finding new ways to, to identify and prospect for resources on the moon that are more efficient, that can disrupt terrestrial industry here. It's about developing new ways to deliver healthcare on other planets that can address our immediate needs for healthcare here. Um, uh, and so, so it's all these things. Space technologies have uh, constantly uh, and continually uh, driven innovation for, for big uh, uh, challenges on Earth um, in ways that we could predict and in other ways that we could not predict. A lot of the MRI uh, processing technologies that are used today come from the original uh, image processing from the Apollo mission. Um, mm. And so in ways that we were trying to process images for the moon actually yielded insights um, for how we uh, uh, process uh, medical images. Um, there's other ties between uh, medical imaging um, and, and um, uh, uh, various telescope works and satellites that have been built. Um, and so you're, you're never really sure where the innovation comes. The beauty of going to the moon is we have all these huge challenges to solve. Right. And so it's this infinite pool of, of, of hard problems and solving those problems will, will drive innovation and, and novel science that can end up being applied in, in unknown and known ways. And do we have, Dan, especially in Canada, because Canada is such a huge presence for the terrestrial mining community, like are there mining companies or even like mining equipment companies that are involved in these discussions so far? I would hope so. I would hope like Caterpillar is building moon mining equipment or, or at least involved in the conversations, right? To again, capture some of that excitement and innovation. Are you seeing yeah, that? Yeah, so K Komatsu uh, in, in Japan has been working with the, the Japanese space agency, uh, JAXA. Uh, towards adapting some of their technology. I know Caterpillar has been working with uh, uh, NASA and the U.S. government for a long time. Um, uh, I think, you know, in, in Canada, there's certainly uh, uh, some movement towards that, and, and we're here to work with other companies um, that uh, want to be part of this uh, new, new supply chain. But, you know, kind of like um, in the terrestrial mining industry, I don't think innovation comes from the majors, innovation is driven um, and de-risking is driven by uh, juniors and the explorers and the risk takers, right? And so, so that's how we kind of see ourselves, right? That we don't think that it's it's not going to be um, a barrack that's going to pave the way to, to mining on the moon, right? It's going to be uh, uh, the mavericks like myself who are uh, willing to take the, the time and risk and opportunity uh, to do so, that will open it up for everyone else. But we're here fundamentally, we think it takes a village and, and we're here to work with partners uh, across that um, value chain. Very cool. Awesome. Very, very cool. Um, so we are running out of time, just a smidge here. So I'm gonna put a last call for comments and questions in the chat slash comments section. Um, and while we're waiting for people to kind of ask those final questions, um, 
what kind of like final thoughts do you guys have, especially like Tatiana, you from like the AI kind of side of things, Alessandra from like the data and finance side of things. Um, we'll kind of go round table again and, and squeeze in any final thoughts or ideas here while we're waiting for people to ask questions. So Tatiana, I'm gonna start with you. Okay, well, from the AI point of view, uh, here, the AI is not doing anything groundbreaking. It just carries on doing what it was always doing, trying us to, trying to help us to make easy decisions without our presence. Uh, so basically, the most important part is making autonomous robots and other um, equipment that can react to unknown situations outside the Earth um, area. Um, so th this is the most important, I think, for us, because we don't want to always send uh, humans to various locations where it's not comfortable for humans to be. Um, and uh, delaying, you know, because the communication as well is quite slow between the Earth and wherever we are going, like asteroids and Moon and Mars and so on. So it's um, very unproductive to always uh, help all work and then wait for communication from the earth to resolve the problem. Um, I think we, we can see it all the time with Mars rovers where the things are slowed down. No one knows what's happening uh, with the probes that we have sent in 1970s. Sometimes they disappear for two weeks. No one knows what's happening. So we want uh, those gaps to, to be handled by AI more or less well. Um, hopefully better than we can do in any case. So this is the most important part, but there are also more traditional th uh, data analysis tasks, uh, such as analyzing where to go, what, uh, what are we looking, how can we use very limited knowledge about um, what uh, uh, information that we collect about the geology of uh, planets or asteroids uh, structure how we can use this information to guess the rest. So this is, I, I would call it traditional data science. And uh, I honestly believe that human race is basically moving into a direction of becoming more like cyborgs where we would uh, give up a bit of our human biology because it is very inconvenient and uh, have our souls uh, encompassed somewhere in a half human, half robot body. And um, here again, um, exploring space is very interesting to me because, um, you know, RNA came from, uh, from space. So this is a programming language of programming uh, biological matter. And uh, this is what we need to understand. And um, um, from what I hear, because um, all the things about life outside the Earth were kind of a taboo for many decades, there is very little investment right now. So people are investing in things that are um, more theoretical and uh, it's basically the investment into life outside the solar system, well, outside the Earth actually uh, in general, is very insufficient. And I think it is a great omission because we can learn so much uh, about how life can be created, um, what are the mechanisms to change, like we have uh, genetic engineering already here on Earth, but we, we kind of do so little and there is so much that we can do once we understand this programming language of uh, biological computers, not, uh, I consider ourselves as biological computers. So this is AI part of space exploration. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I agree with a lot of Tatiana's points that we haven't looked at it enough to really even understand the potential there. And a lot of it, I think, has been just up until I would say like the last two years, like if you talked about this stuff, people look at you like you're a weirdo. And yet now we've got like, all of these documentary, I mean, uh, you know, documentation and evidence of what do they call them now? Like um, UA, uh, UFOs, basically, like in the U.S., right? Like uh, these unexplained aerial phenomenon. I forget how they what they call it now. Where it's like there was like no 
much into that just about in the news this year. That was like not even the top 10 weirdest thing that happened in the world this year. It was like basically the U.S. military saying, yes, we can't figure out what these things are. So I think there's so much there that, that we haven't looked at. And I think from the, again, I'm really excited about how excited people will get about the science. And like I see, we've got, I know we've got at least one geophysicist on the chat right now. Like, I mean, basic stuff to me that will be really cool. Like, will geophysics techniques work in space? Like you can't use, I don't, I assume, you know, gravity magnetics data, right? Or certainly not in the same way. So like, it's one thing to just talk about like deposits at the surface, but how do you do exploration in space? Like, how do you do all of this stuff without disturbing dust that goes up and makes huge dust clouds and pollutes, you know, the, the moon or Mars atmosphere, like the technology of how you build a drill rig without having <laughs> copious amounts of water or like vibracore drills, where again, I would assume that it would create a huge pollution cloud that you wouldn't want for other reasons. So I'm really fascinated by that as part of what I love about science fiction novels and TV shows that really get into the mechanics of how people think this stuff will work, right? And kind of come up with these inventions in a fictional atmosphere, because like, these are all really detailed questions that you know, we'll have to figure out in order to make this stuff a reality. And, and a lot of it comes down to, you know, science is important. <laughs> we, we need people to be really excited about science and figuring it out. <laughs> really deep thought of the day from Emily. Science. Yeah, those, those are all very good thoughts. <laughs> very good. I, just speaking of deep thought, um, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, very relevant there. Um, yeah. Sorry, relevant. I just pinged a, a tickle the nerve in my brain there. <laughs> Don't forget, don't forget your yeah. towel when you're towel yes <laughs> yep um Alessandra, it's your turn there. all right so i think i have two perspectives when we talk about the space mining in general first if we are going to if we are talking about in the nearest future i think that if we are talking about mining for to use on the space, I think that I am a hundred percent of a supporter. I think that the investment, although it's going to be large, it's not going to be as expensive and as uh, riskier as talking about uh, exploring or doing mining in the space to bring back uh, to Earth. So from that perspective, I think that I will take much more time because we will need investment from private companies. But and for that, I'm going to move into the data is that they need more data. And I think that at this point, we don't have enough data to make a financial investment decision that doesn't involve a high, high risk to pursue. And something that mentioned uh, briefly, Emily, and I think it's important, uh, is that if we remember about, uh, if we remember the, story, the history of mining, we started with the unknown. We started going into trying to exploring new areas, discovering how to uh, different minerals as we start uh, discovering them. And all of that at the beginning, the mining was uh, something that pollutes a lot because there were no regulations for, for all the pollutions. So I think for all the pollution or, or, or we, are not, we were not as concerned about environmental as we are right now, or as we started being aware about uh, 25 or 30 years ago. So if I we talk about space, I would prefer to go uh, the reverse uh, way that we, we did with in Earth with mining. We need to first uh, see how we are going to regulate what environmental uh, potential issues we are going to find in the space, regulate those, and then we can start doing mining because I, I don't want to, to happen in the space the same thing that happened on Earth that we pollute for a few, for tons of years until we started regulating and learning more about uh, how to reduce or even eliminate the risk, the, risk of, the risk of mining. So those are my, my thoughts. We need someone to regulate not only for, for who owns the space, for the rights, but also about uh, how we are going to be working on space. I'm not going to talk about ESG because we are not sure about the S part, or if we're going to find some communities on space or something like that. But at least taking about what we know is the, the environment. We need to avoid a disruption of well, the government as well. Awesome. Thanks for those. Dan, how are you? Final thoughts, comments you want to get out there? Insights and ideas? All, yeah, all, all very good uh, uh, comments and thoughts. I mean, I think there's um, 
you know, lots of, of technical challenges and innovation um, that need to be solved, as, as Tatiana was saying, that can drive uh, more robotics, more innovation, which is disruptive to terrestrial industry. There's tons of gaps to fill in terms of uh, data um, and, and geophysical information, geotechnical information, which we believe and we have seen that um, can change the way things are done with terrestrial mining industry. We've already uh, created entirely new geotechnical and geophysical technologies as a company in, in the work we're doing for space. Um, and, and there are a lot of issues that need to be figured out, um, as, as Alessandra was saying, um, you know, in uh, how to, what, what is the right way to go about this? The reality is we don't have the, the luxury of sitting around and, and waiting um, uh, and trying to eliminate all the risk. I mean, I think, you know, if you, it, it's easy if you're in a terrestrial resource role to, to look at it and say, okay, well, we can, you know, once we've eliminated all the risk, we don't have time for that. Right. So the, the, there, there are all these interrelated missions going to the moon that are going to need these resources in, uh, in order to sustain them. And it, it starts small from there. And, you know, likely we need to uh, figure this out in, in multiple steps. In the immediate years, is it needed to figure out all, all the issues? No. Should we be ensuring up front that we are trying to um, export best practices as humanity and not our worst? Definitely. Right. Um, is it economically va uh, viable to mine on on the moon? Sure, there's lots of studies that have um, that have sufficient data. We know there's enough water. We know there's you know a high amount of oxygen content within the regolith, um, and these things are quite valuable. As as we as it pertains to to resources from asteroids and other stuff, there's there's greater levels of uncertainty, and and we'll get there when we need to get there. Um, I, I, I'm optimistic. Uh, I think there has never been a more exciting time uh, for space, for, for uh, mining innovation that can be driven from uh, space mining. And, and that can you know, positively affect the way that we do mining on Earth, um, as well as drive innovation uh, across a number of sectors. I look forward awesome. to being able to, to carry space mining 43101s and jorks just like we do <laughs> deep sea mining ones right Jeff? yeah we're gonna have to really redo the uh it's gonna have to go from like google earth to like where they do the like the, the, the space yeah. thing a long time yeah. ago um cool we, we are like out of time so thank you all for joining um daniel if people have questions or they want to follow what you're up to and whatnot where can they what is the best way to get a hold of you um ask questions and whatnot yeah, we're 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 on Twitter uh, at Dan Sachs at, at CSMC underscore SCMS um, on Twitter uh, or X or whatever the hell it's called at this point in time, uh, and we're on LinkedIn, which still functions normally. Um, uh, Canadian Space Mining Corporation CSMC, um, uh, come follow us and and reach out and find out. We're always looking for uh, for people, for investors, and for strategic partners. So don't be shy. Awesome. Thank you. And as always, if you want to keep up with what's happening in the mining world, we here at Prospector, um, follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, and everything else as well. Um, and again, just keep an eye out for this recording in next week's Weekly Nugget. If you're not subscribed to the Weekly Nugget, head over to our website to do that now. Um, just again, thank you all for joining us. And I look forward to you next month. And again, thanks, Dan, for joining us as our special guest. Thank you for having me. It was uh, an honor to, to share this virtual stage with so many great insights and, and, and minds. Um, you're all so, so great. Yeah, we appreciate you uh, taking all our space questions. <laughs> <laughs> Have a great Monday, everybody. Thank you. Awesome. Bye -bye. Thanks all. Bye.